good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to another episode of Endurance Chat. I'm Michael Zalavari, also known as Floodman11, and I have with me Austin Zetsman. How are you doing on this fine Sunday morning over in wherever you are at the moment? I keep forgetting. Is it Wisconsin or, or Florida nowadays? No, it's, it's Florida. It's, it's Florida. Florida. How are you doing in Florida? It's really, It's really hot down here, up here, Michael. Great. <laughs> Uh, we're still going through hurricane season, so we're just literally dodging uh, massive hurricanes left and right. Um, the Indian uh, blessing or whatever on this place that is uh, a local legend is alive and well. So, brilliant! Everybody's safe and sound, but still very hot in uh, in Florida summer right now. I am jealous. It is we've had glimpses of summer in Australia so far. Little little tiny glimpses of one day of thirty degrees and then rain. And at the moment we're in the rain uh part of that uh equation. Uh speaking of rain, we also have an Englishman. Hello Ollie, thank you for joining us. Oh hey, sorry I'm late. <laughs> just in time, just in time for the start. How are you doing? I uh, heard you had a bike trip today. Yeah, it's right. Uh and yesterday. Slept in a building that's like four times as old as Cookie's Country. That was all right. <laughs> wow, that's that 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 is a, a weird flex, okay. but okay. Uh, guys, we're here today because we've got to wrap up Lamar. It's been three weeks since the three weeks. Yeah, math checks out. Three weeks since the twenty four hours of Lamar for twenty twenty one. We haven't had a chance to talk about it yet because that old life thing. But guys. Lamar, how do, what do we think? How how do we feel? How, how how did you intake the experience of the twenty four hours into your body? Cookie first. Oh wow. Okay. Good. I'll I'll start with what a, what. A, okay. Maybe maybe Ollie first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no no no. I mean, well deserved, I guess. Um, for the overall winners, um, they've definitely have earned that win. Um. It's not like it's not completely trend setting between uh you know both uh Toyota GR O one O's finishing one two. Um, you know, I think a lot of people were hoping that there was gonna be some reliability that came into factor here. I mean, either with Alpine winning or Glickenhaus doing something or even an LMP two winning. Um, but really the Toyotas prove that they're really, really reliable. And um We'll talk more about it in terms of like how reliable, but that was, I think, the most impressive part to me outside of the number seven winning was just um, like, I mean, I feel like this is the only chassis that we really know what it looks like for the OEMs uh, that are going to be coming. But this is a pretty good measuring stick, I feel like, in terms of like a a solid, reliable car that is very, very quick. and it seems to be quick in multiple different weather conditions, which we also saw in the race too. Mm. Um, but yeah, otherwise, sorry, I focus a lot on Toyota being oh, really? my, my overall thing. No I, way. But, I, uh, the Toyota fan was focused on Toyota, guys. Who would have thought? There is a, also a very good LMP2 race uh, as well. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like. Um, I would almost want to say that this, like the race was chaos. I... It, it wasn't really for the second half up until right mm. at the end, but I don't know. I feel like this race was pretty chaotic. Like maybe controlled chaos is more of an appropriate term, just because I feel like there wasn't a ton of like crazy mistakes, like driver errors that were like serious or anything like that. But I don't know. I feel like I'll go with that as my answer. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you managed to spend. What three minutes talking about Toyota? <laughs> yeah, well, well, because uh, no cookie. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. I promise. All right, all right, okay, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Ollie, what about you? How did the Le Mans experience feel for you? It it was nice. Yeah, uh, I still didn't kind of live up to being there in person, mm, especially for like such a milestone of of this new era. Um, but. Um, yeah, we still make the most of what we can. And, um, yeah, we did do that. It was, um, it was good fun. Um, I did not, I apologize. I did not stay up for the whole thing. Um, yes, I did have an hour power nap. Um, but nothing happened anyway. So (laughs) happy days. 
Um, yeah, it was probably at like four in the morning or something. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that, that would have been fine. Yeah. See, I, um, I made the mistake of being on the other side of the planet. So when I went to bed at three in the morning, Australian time, which would have been just an hour or so before nightfall, I missed just everything in the next three oh, no. hours. <laughs> oh. And then so when no, I woke no. up, all the chaos had already happened and then it was just cars lapping around Lamar for the next... 16 hours which admittedly i loved like i just love watching cars go around the track uh but yeah i, I guess missed... you woke up to yellow flags and like nothing happening yeah pretty much like i yeah. i i remember i stirred when the project one car hit mulsan the mulsan chicane and i saw that and what, i went like oh, you had an, big an emotional and uh, an emotional reaction in your sleep to like a favorite car crashing or something yeah no it was just weird like i just i just like stirred i wasn't i didn't even wake up i like stirred because i didn't have any sound coming through my computer uh so i, I just like like glimpsed at it oh, so you didn't happened. care you went back to sleep yeah well i was care. i I, no. I didn't have to be awake for another two hours at that point <laughs> so i went back to bed <laughs> uh, yeah i i gotta say it was a bit of a weird experience for me because i actually didn't watch any of the lead up almost any of the lead up when it came to the the practice sessions the qualifying sessions because uh it would have interrupted uh my you know normal working hours so i actually didn't see i I saw one hour of a practice session in the lead up to to the race so i kind of came in a bit a bit blind this year which is a very weird and different experience for me but uh I, i i definitely enjoyed the support classes on the on the day uh, of of the Saturday, uh, which started at a very early uh, seven pm uh, for me, uh, and then yeah, the the race was like as I said, I enjoyed watching cars just lap the track. It's the, one of my favorite parts of the year. Yeah, the sports were pretty cool. Um, see my old boss win win a race and stand Your on top of the boss? podium. Yeah, my old boss. Wow, yeah. what um, was he driving in? Uh, it was the uh Delara Judd um prototype. Oh no way. That's yeah, rad. So, that, that, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, he's pretty good. Pretty good, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, I think he's doing British GT. Uh maybe a one off or something. But yeah, he's dabbling into modern motorsport. He he's done quite well with historics because that's the company does classics and mm. restoration and stuff like that. But um You should ask him he if he needs to be a doing all right. engineer. Ha. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, it was good. Interesting lead in. Yeah, I, I quite like that. I hope we get to see more of that sort of stuff. Uh, of course, normally that we'd have the the Le Mans Classic weekend in around this time of year, around September. Uh, but of course, with 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 2021 being an echo of 2020 and the madness that was, uh, that's all but kind of been compressed down. So uh, a cool support event, certainly. Uh, what about what about the race specifically? How do we how do we feel about the race? Cookies already mentioned the LMH class and the the LMP2 battle. What about the uh, the uh, GT cars? How do we feel about the the GT classes on a whole throughout the race? In GT Pro, um, it was a bit of a shame that the the kind of the Porsches um, fell back over time during the race, and uh, considering their quality, and you know, when from watching wet rounds with them going up against Ferrari, it's it's, it's been really exciting. Um, so I was expecting it to be like a normal wet round with a cherry on top of Corvette, and then the other one-offs um mm. but unfortunately they all seem to kind of fall away a bit um i was expecting a bit more out of you know like the the hub auto and and yeah so it was, it was a bit of a shame there but on the other hand it was still pretty good um on on the whole for pro um it, it's just not not the same compared to you know four years ago when there were over twice the number of entries in that class but it's different um yeah. and uh and and that's translated or offset towards gtm where it's just an absolutely ridiculously sized class um with with some really quality entries you know you you look at lmp2 and like how kind of professional sneaky professional some of the outfits are you've still got the same with gtm as well like um 
yeah, there's some some real gems in there, and it was good to watch them. And and I liked how much TV time GTM specifically got. It seemed like I, uh, you know, it, it was more uh, TV time than they'd ever got in the past. Cookie, what about you? What did you think of the the GT competitions on a whole? Um, I mean, we definitely weren't too far away from. I mean, I guess we are getting farther away. It seems uh, from like tw- you know 2015, 2016, where we had huge GT Pro fields and numerous different chassis um so you know it's it's good to see the c8s here and racing um you know i feel like that's where these things belong you know it's going to be weird to see corvette in whatever shape and form it's going to take on in the next few years um and i really hope this doesn't like force them to do anything drastic where we're not seeing them at Le Mans, but um I don't know. I, I mean, I, I feel like there's been a lot of talk around that and then, you know, more ACO announcements around that, that, mm. I don't know, that was an underlying tone for me looking at the GTPE Pro battles. Um, <clears throat> the Ferrari just looked like it was the best chassis for this, you know, for this year's running of Le Mans and uh, that showed in GTE Pro and AM. Um, AM was pretty close, but <clears throat> 83 was just really quick. Um, and I would have really liked to see, yeah, I agree with uh, Ali, would have liked to see Porsche fighting a little bit more in GT Pro. Yeah, it was a, a bit of a weird one for Porsche, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, when we get towards the the tail end of the uh, podcast today. But I wanted to actually uh, round back to the start of the race and talk about the the opening little section because there was a, a, a bit of disappointment that after a, a great race, uh, sorry, a great week of beautiful blue skies and uh, summery French weather that the we had a, a shower between the last support race and the start of the main race, which saw the first few laps actually under safety car. Now, uh, we it's not the first time in recent history that we've seen the, the race start under safety car. It was only, what, 2016 that we saw uh, the, the uh, main race start with, I think it was an hour under safety car before uh, 2016 got underway. Um, but once we did finally get going, it was action at the first corner already in LMH with, I think it was one of the Glickenhaus cars, one, uh, I think it was Olivia Pla, just running straight into the side of the number eight, like off the line. Whoops. Yeah, whoops. It was, they started with a bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was shades of uh, the rebellion with the front falling off last year as well. S- oh, similar yeah. sort of vibe. Yeah, that, yeah, that, w- that was really strange too. Because you like the way in which it happened, you didn't really know what was going on. And uh, like <laughs> it wasn't until replays where you're like, oh, that thing just like literally slid off. Yeah. Yeah. Rebellion too. But no, yeah, this was... Uh, I don't know. I I love these kind of races because uh, I think it tightens the field in 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 different respects. But there is a clear edge for Toyota if you're even if it is only um, starting at 120 uh, kph. It's still um, more effective to have four tires moving mm. um, if you're trying to go through potential areas where there's aquaplaning, um, which we saw in great abundance in certain areas. Um, and uh, and yeah. I mean, it was a really, really panicky, like, worst-case scenario start for Toyota, who have had to deal with, like, weird gremlin issues. And the last thing you want, um, you know, even if you're not having an issue, is for something to break in the last lap again, um, which you could easily have happen at any lap, considering where uh, Glickenhaus hit. Um, Mm. And it was right, I think, on the rear axle, the left rear tire. So, I mean, you know... I'm I'm just I'm completely shocked that that had you know it, it finished where it did without really any more issues. Um, I think they were the checking the the gearbox pretty yeah. like constantly. I think they were, oh, were they? Yeah. playing on the on the radio like yeah we're monitoring the gearbox and stuff like that because yeah it's very difficult to change after they made the Audi rule where you can't change gearbox mm-hmm. casing. So <laughs> bloody Audi. <laughs> Ruining everything. So, I mean, it's just a really, really stellar effort. Like, I, yeah. I mean, and that is exactly what Toyota needed, considering how many issues they've had previously in the past where stuff's happened just mid-race, and they haven't been able to recover from it. Um, this was more or less like, you know, just kind of proving that the car is reliable and it can actually take some hits and still be fast and still finish, which is something uh... that they really get. <laughs> hey, hey, I mean, uh... so far, so far. Well, they were close. 
to yeah 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 pissing it away the entire second half of the race they were dealing with some sort of fuel delivery problem which may or may not have been as a result of the contact uh but cookie's overall point is uh, pretty solid the fact that they were able to to ride a a hit like that and it was a substantial hit let's make no mistake olivia pla doesn't like he doesn't crash half-hearted when we when he crashes he properly crashes we've seen that uh, a few times over in the imsa weathertech uh, sports car championship or as he ended up on the tire barrier at both most sport and Road Atlanta in various uh, yes. guises. Um, Correct. So, so uh, it was good for Toyota to be able to get to the end on that. But they were there were some seriously concerned faces and some seriously concerning radio calls in the second half of the race as the to- the number eight had to make shorter and shorter stints to deal with w- what was a, a very weird uh, fuel delivery problem where it seemed that they weren't able to get all of the fuel from the tank into the engine in every single stint, which was a bit... I, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of anything like that uh, during a race. Maybe it was like a fuel pump issue where, where the, the pump wasn't working effectively or something. I'm not sure. I thought it was to do with the um, the G-forces, um, either um, a pickup issue or picking up debris inside mm. the tank. Um, so they turned off the fuel pumps... Uh, at every braking zone uh, and through the corners I, I believe so um, yeah there was a lot of stuff going on for the drivers at the wheel um, having to switch buttons um, flick switches at every corner basically at every lap for at least a third of the race the last third of the race um, yeah it's a bit bit ridiculous but um, well, yeah, they managed to get it work. And if you look at the post-race quotes from uh, the winning, even the winning car, because even the winning car had a similar problem in the latter stages, uh, saying that, uh, you know, Mike Conway said, we had a real problem with the car. The team came up with a solution to keep us going. So uh, they they were really quite concerned with it. So while, while there was a uh, perfect reliability, and I put that in air quotes, perfect reliability for the LMH class, it was not, all a uh, smooth sailing for Toyota. So that, does that make their their win here like even more incredible? The fact that they were contending with such a such a deep seated issue in in that car. Um, well, because let's be real here: if they didn't I'm, have such an advantage, they wouldn't have won. That's exactly what I was about to say. Yeah, if, yeah, if you yeah. remove that question mark over the car, uh, they were basically untroubled by their comp- competition from the end of the first hour to the end of the race like they they were it was the 23 hours of toyota effectively again <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> no the, the cynical hat's taken off but it's like ollie you, the cynical the, hat's sewn the... to your head <laughs> <laughs> i've got nothing on my head trust me <laughs> <laughs> Alpine, they needed like to get lucky with yellows, basically, to offset their stint disadvantages. Um, and there were lots of yellows. There were plenty of safety cars, but they just didn't get the them to fall nicely mm. for them. Um, and that kind of took them out of the game, as it were, um, at the halfway point. Let's say they just had fallen back a, a cycle um, in, or fallen back enough to not be able to. Uh, climb back up kind of the way that it would work in America where you can constantly get your lap back kind of thing. Um, and with the Glickenhaus, yeah, they they still had the pace disadvantage from the round previously um, in, in terms of uh, stint uh, race pace um, because they're still a pretty quick car on a lap, um, on a good lap. But... Um, yeah, the 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 advantages for Toyota were pretty much locked in uh, going into this round. Um, I, I was wondering about you know had they been sandbagging to to make their advantage even better. Um, if you look at it, the gap uh, the gaps between the cars has kind of uh, roughly doubled since Monza. But then if you think uh, if you if you kind of average out though the difference in track where 
uh, Monza is like a third distance um, or, or uh, yeah, let's say a third distance of Le Mans. If you, if you normalize by track length, then they're actually just, just the same gaps between the cars. Yeah, so it's pretty much locked in. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the moral of that story is their advantage was still locked in and they almost threw it away. Um, if, if, that deteriorated they would have been really in a bad place because to change that fuel tank you've got to take either the, i guess the engine off so cut the car in half effectively or take the interior out to get it from the inside so that would have been a long long job for both cars um yeah not yeah. the best well, it, it's, that could be worse. It's yeah. Well, it, it could have been a, a terminal issue that could have taken them out of the race entirely. So the fact that they managed that quite effectively was uh, it was very very good for them. Let's let's talk about that battle for third place, uh, Alpine versus Glickenhaus, and we were sort of billing this as the the more interesting battle throughout the race. Uh, it was in the end the Alpine that took third late on, uh, it, making the advantage of that uh, late race full course yellow or, or safety car. Um, when uh, they when Eduardo likes to do his uh, full course debris clean up in the the mid morning sun. Uh, but really for me, the the telling point was overnight. Uh, Nicola Lapierre getting into that car and actually dragging it up the field uh, against both Glickenhauses to take a, a, a sincere advantage. Uh, Alpine with a third place. Do you reckon they'd be satisfied with with that result? Considering their handicap, as it were, with the 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 stint lengths and the, the amount of fuel they can carry um, in their out, outdated car. Uh, 100%. Yes. Yeah. Cookie, what do you reckon? Uh, a, pe- uh, a podium? Yeah. Um, I, I think, if anything, um, their hopes and optimism would have been pinned on maybe a second. Because um, <clears throat> otherwise, this is a great result for them. I mean, they were within a second of, well, not necessarily. Of the leaders just outside of a second of uh like fastest lap from leaders they were you know i, I think the toyotas really kind of just came down a little bit to alpine's pace when and that was their like lower level um and so I, you know it, it definitely kept toyota having to at least not back off a ton um and yeah for what i said what for the handicap that they had i think this is as much as they wanted to expect and i you know i, I think they and a bunch of us thought they were going to be finishing ahead, ahead of Glickenhaus, even though they have on an, an on paper disadvantage. So, um, yeah, I think this is probably as good as they're going to expect. And, and more disappointment in from Glickenhaus than from Alpine. Oh, okay, so result. I'll just finish off the Alpine story by saying a podium for Alpine is a very, very good. Uh, notion to the board to say hey we can do this uh in a new spec of car soon uh but let's talk about Glickenhaus because when we uh got to turn one after the actual race started and uh Pla made contact with the Toyota the the Glickenhaus memes were at uh, absolute maximum because of course they were going to be everyone was waiting for them to fail but then they they didn't. They they got back on track. They kept going. Neither car had any problems. The number 709 ended up uh, making its way back through the field. And both Glickenhauses finished the race. Both Glickenhauser, we remember, we, we, we officially decided on the, the plural. Both of them finished the race. And not only that, they finished in fourth and fifth overall. And in fact, it's the only time in the modern LMP1 era, or the modern LMH era, rather, that... Uh, all of the cars entered in the top class have finished in the top position. So that, that's a, an absolute feather in the cap for, for Glickenhaus and the SCG 007 to say that at the end of the day, they were still running. And not only that, they were running at, at a comparable pace to the leaders. That's an astounding achievement. Yeah, and um, the considering the rhetoric after Monza, you know, oh, reliability, will the brakes hold up? You know, they had to do brake changes in a shorter format race at Monza. They're going to have to do two brake changes for each car. Just remember, like, the Nissan had to do, Mm. you know, like three brake changes. Um, It's going to be a a failure of gargantuan proportions, actually. 
they spent the least amount of time in the pits because the Alpine had to do more stops because of the shorter fueling and Toyota had to do more stops because of their self-imposed shorter stints for reliability at the end. So actually, you know, if you placed a bet that the team that the top two cars uh, with the least amount of time in the pit lane, both of them were the Glickenhaus cars, you'd probably get some good good money yeah. back on that bet. Yeah, I bet. Well, I, I didn't, but I, I, I wish I did. I would uh, that, bet. That yeah. would have been good. Uh, but it, it's it, for a, a team debut at Le Mans, we haven't seen something like this for a brand new team to do that well since what like aston martin back in not not the amr1 but like the 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 lola days were the only ones to finish that comprehensively well like janetta didn't do that well nissan didn't do that well uh porsche a certain a certain team did quite well on their debut in the 90s just saying um <laughs> with the the um black ueno clinic car oh yeah okay well um, even, yeah. that's that's still mm. that's 25 years ago is the last time a debut <laughs> team did that well so yeah that's yeah. you're gonna say in, in in terms of recent living memory because ollie i i know you and i are about the similar age and that would have been when we were in 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 nappies uh that the mclaren did uh that sort of performance so in recent living memory there hasn't been a debutant not even porsche when they returned to the top class had a Le Mans that was as successful as a fourth and a fifth place for glickenhaus not even porsche Shocking. it's from a relatively small outfit you know yeah podium technology it's a pretty small team they haven't been doing this stuff for at this level for too long you know it's more of a garage east style uh, outfit um but yeah fair play and that's going to be a, a big uh, shot in the arm to the the Glickenhaus program who because jim was umming and ahhing about completing the season and you know saying it depends a lot on customers and all that sort of stuff but after getting two cars to the finish of lamar you'd be hard pressed to find a reason to stop wouldn't you i would think so um, you know, they've definitely shown that the car can make it all 24 hours. Um, and I, I, I wasn't skeptical of the, uh, of Pippa Motors, um, under the hood. Uh, I, I think for them, it was their first foray into endurance racing, but, um, I, I think that we've seen so many blunders in the last 20 years in terms of, um, startup, uh, entries and different designs and, and engine, um, mating kind of attempts that re- engine reliability was super important. And I think Jim focused on that as well. And, you know, it was able to make it 24 hours. And, and that was really, really impressive. Um, the fact that they were able to sustain damage like that and then they were able to continue. I, I think the car did go um, into the garage for a bit, um, but came back right back out. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I mean, it was. It was a great, great effort for them to finish. Um, there, it's clear that the car can could use some extra mileage and get some more setup in it. It looked really twitchy um, mm. and some understeery in in some certain high speed corners and <clears throat> I think some mid speed corners as well. Um, but otherwise, they made it to finish. That's a huge effort. And, and and that's more that, you know, the likes of Nissan, the likes of Janetta, the likes of uh, Aston Martin in their own machinery, That that's more than what they can say over the past 15 years of competition. So that, that's a huge boon for uh, Jim Quickenhouse. It's a few, huge boon for the SCG operation and everyone involved. That, that's just an entirely impressive result. And, uh, you know, the fact that not only did they uh, finish the race, but they beat all the LMP2s as well. Like... That can't be understated as an achievement because LMP2, as Ollie alluded to, is so professional at the moment and so full of class and so full of great driving and great teams that it's it's just an incredibly impressive achievement to be able to outdo that in your own bespoke machinery like that. The, the fact that LMP2 is a spec class and the fact that it's meant to be the second class doesn't really matter when everything about it is so good. 
So uh, yeah, props to to uh, Glickenhaus, and I hope I hope this that form rolls into to further races because I'd love to see them stick around on the grid for for more and give some of the the, the new guys that are coming in next year uh, a bit of a benchmark uh, to to race against. Any any further comments on the LMH race, guys? Any any final things that you wanted to add? No, yeah. um, I think for some people it'll be they'll say that it was boring. Um... Yeah, I mean, compared to some of the other classes, <laughs> which we'll get to, it was. But um, I think this is what LMH needed um, at, for itself uh, and to prove kind of to people like, yes, the old stuff will work. That's slight like disadvantage. Um, but the new stuff is, you know, like, I don't know. I I think people were really concerned about how fast these cars were going to get. I mean, we're probably going to get back down to like maybe sub 320s. <clears throat> within the five-year, you know, homologation period, I feel like, unless the ACO or if I do something to try to slow these cars down or make have Mitchell make a slightly worse performing tire, but I, the performance of these cars is going to get, it's just going to continue to improve. Um, and it was cool to see, at least for me, looking house obviously struggling with their setup, but then also Toyota, that car is just super, like, you, it's super animated. <clears throat> it's way more animated than I've seen any other LMP1H. So that's the cool thing to see if whether or not with these new chassis or just even from next year, if that's going to continue to be in the case or, you know, are these cars just going to be more lively and that's going to just be fun to watch as a uh, as a fan. So I, I really enjoy the hyper hypercar class despite any dramas. Yeah. Uh, what about what about you, Ollie? Any, any comments on LMH? Yeah, well, we're still in a bit of a... We're still in the transition period towards you know the the what's yet to come um after several years of it it feels like um yeah even the what what we have now is going to improve regardless of Peugeot coming which is absolutely insane um Lickenhouse are going to get I think better tires um more optimized for their rear wheel drive only setup um so that should help with the gap um to the top of the class um and yeah we're gonna have two proper 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 factory yeah uh, <laughs> with Peugeot coming back Peugeot versus Toyota it's gonna be it's gonna be good and then you, you know we got more and more and more after that so are they, are be they doing more a patient. two or three car effort do you think for Le Mans Peugeot Ooh. At the moment, two. Yeah, it has to be two with their driver lineup. I wonder if but, anybody's going to do three. I don't think there'll be the grid space for three in the future. I think there will just be too many cars in the top class to afford uh, any team having three. Well, there'll be space next just... year. Yeah, that's true. They're yeah. going to put it up. But do you think? Do you think there'll be a standing like the ACL? Will just be like, no, we can't. Like, I like a specific rule that you can't have more than two. Or, um, yeah. Uh, for hypercar that'd be well they haven't won it unless yeah. they go into like asian le mans series with an lmp3 and try and, <laughs> and do a sort of that's, that's Sport true Total that's true in lmp3 yeah. and win uh, an auto invite and then convert it into an lmp or well oh, you caught me there um uh, into a hypercar <laughs> um yeah I, I can see it happening you just gotta just gotta wait and see you know uh, maybe a little rumor Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> deep into the deep into the uh, rumor mill already. Uh, to, to round out uh. LMH, uh, it was actually the number seven. Uh, all three drivers with their first win at Le Mans: Mike Conway, Kamu Kobayashi, and Juan Maria Lopez. Uh, so well done to them. Uh, Toyota's fourth win in a row, matching the best streak of Bentley and of oh, I had this written down somewhere and I've forgotten it. Uh, oh, oh no. Uh, and Ferrari, no Ford. Ferrari. Mm. So matching the best streak of of Bentley and Ford. Uh, not the best streak overall, though. That's still owned by Porsche because Group C was the thing that happened. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I we were going to talk about it, but here we are talking about it. Talking about it. Yeah, well, we had to. We're always going to talk about <laughs> Porsche. Yep. Okay. It's 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 Lamar. If you if you talk about Lamar, you've got to talk about Porsche because they wait, just. Ha, uh, wait. How many? How many is that flood? How many uh, do they have? Nineteen. In a row. Not in a row. Uh Porsche no. Porsche's most is uh seven in a row. Eighty one okay. to eighty seven. 
That's that that's that's the goal Toyota's is going for. Do you reckon they can get seven in a row? So seven, seven in a row would be what 20, uh, 2018 all the way through till twenty twenty three twenty twenty no twenty twenty four. So they'd have to win the next three in a row as well. Could they be the oh, next man. Mercedes? I don't know. They've got to beat an LMDH then in that final year. Oh, that's going to be tough. That yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they'd have to win the centenary event as well, and or oh, that would that would that's going to be a big one. Is that going to be a big one? Do you, do you think? Do you think? Uh, do you think there's going to be some some uh, ACO official kicking of any car that isn't French on that one? Well, here's the thing: so many teams have uh, prestige and anniversaries for Le Mans that you can't really just like a uh, free kick the the hundredth anniversary to or the yeah the centenary event to anyone with BOP because everyone's got a reason to want that better BOP I mean I agree with you but for the, for jokes I mean don't put it past the ACO oh I know we we do we do like to to joke that they are Frenchies being Frenchies yeah <laughs> that's what people are like please join LP please join so yeah that- <laughs> You guys can't be Frenchies with each other. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. We'll leave LMH there uh, because I'm sure there'll be plenty. Just, I'm getting to talk about LMP2 because... Yes, let's do uh, it. Because it, it's involving something other than a Toyota doing this. So <laughs> oh, no. This is, it's the first time I can actually be on the other side of this. Uh, and it was black, I, red, and white as well. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dude, seriously. No one should ever Imagine use that, that livery scheme ever again. <laughs> It's so Ugh. ubiquitous with prototype racing. So if you missed it and you were hiding under a rock for the past three weeks, first of all, what the hell have you been doing? Secondly, uh, the team, the, the breakout team of the LMP2 race was really the newcomers. We talked about in the lead up the, you know, the empire of United Auto Sports versus the empire of G-Drive versus the empire of Joda. And in the end, it was the new kids on the block that are uh, as professional as anything, WRT. And I'm going to take credit for calling this, by the way, because I definitely said this in the pre-show, uh, that they were the ones to beat. And they ruled the overnight running, uh, Charles Malesi and uh, uh, Yifeye overnight broke away from everyone uh, and set incredible lap times to basically take the race away from all the other teams. Uh, Settling into the last hours of the race, a comfortable margin out in front. Uh, The Jota Sport team of uh, the number 28, uh, Galeo Van Dorn and Blomquist, started to come back towards the 31. But on the last lap of the race, the last lap, uh, the number 41, the leading car, shut off and and died uh, out of the Dunlop Bridge. And that was it. It was stuck. It was stranded. It did not cross the finish line. It did not finish the race. It went from a comfortable minute margin to, to, to nothing. And it was, uh, it was so, so heartbreaking once again for everyone who wasn't a Toyota fan five years ago and just found it funny. Isn't that right, Cookie? I, didn't, I, I mean, I found it, I, I found it terrible. But I also took solace in the fact that it did it didn't just happen to me and my and my my fan base <laughs> of Toyota fans. Oh. oh yeah, it was it was bad. It was bad. Um, and then it uh, like at the same time, it's uh, it's obviously going to be it's like it's newsworthy for endurance racing. So in a weird positive way, like it's good. And the fact that it happened with Kubica and you know how how much of a huge following he has. And, you know, it's such an emotional loss. Like, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, there's a redemption potentially story for him to come back and try to, like, win or, or um, you know, try to get LMH gig and, and, like, conquer this, like, huge thing that just happened. And then, you know, at the same time, bring it along more fans from him and F1 that, you know, see this side of it where it's, like it's not as dramatic as Formula One, but like it still packs such a huge emotional punch. Like, mm. um, and that anything can happen, even when you know endurance racing is a sprint race, has been drilled in your head for the last twenty four hours. You know, there can be something as crazy as just like an ECU issue, which can just cause the car to just fail. And then as soon as they get it back the next day in Park Ferme, they fire it up and it works. Yeah, like, it's just it's that is that's such a quintessential Lamar thing to happen, you know. So, um, it's just so unfortunate, and it was such a it should have been a well deserved victory for him. 
It, or it should have been a well-deserved one too for the team as well. Let's not forget about that. No. It, it was it was lucky that they had the second car in such a position to be able to take the victory, even despite its own problems as well. Remember the 31 uh, was struggling in the second half of the race with an air jack issue. So they had to actually inflate a a, a bag, what, what Australians would call a big old goon sack, underneath the car to lift the car up so they could do uh, 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 car uh, tire changes in the latter half of the race because of, yeah, because of a problem with the air jack system. So the the fact that they had the second car there to take victory, albeit a very strained victory at the very end of the race, uh, was great work by the team. And and yeah, as you said, it, it fired up on the button the next day after they got it back from Parc Ferme with 20 litres still in the tank. So it was just everything everything worked it was a temporary short in the ecu that shut everything down on the last lap on the last lap of the race like that's i don't care who you are that is a gut punch and a half that hit hard in a weird way like a i kind of conspiracy or something Ooh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> like some guy linked with links to like the holy roman empire because of ferdinand Habsburg, like the royals have got their fingers in loads of pies and there'll be like some guy who's who's got a laptop that <laughs> he presses the enter button and then it shuts down the car and then Ferdy wins. I mean, it's too obvious, guys. Have you seen? Yeah, right, yeah. And then and then Tom Hanks is investigating as a private investigator as well. <laughs> and, and, and if you add up all the numbers in the top three positions, it adds up to the Illuminati, right? That's what happens yep. here. Correct. Yeah. Far out. Oh, uh, that was that wasn't the only story at the end of the race, but I want do want to dedicate a certain amount of time to talk about that independently. Uh, let's talk about the the rest of the LMP2 field though, because uh, we were making a big deal over United versus G Drive versus Joda as as the sort of heavyweight billing, but all of those cars ran into some level of problem throughout the race, and at one point we had two United cars taking each other out at, at running into one. each other. Yeah. So, so it was a, a bit of a, a, a case of last man. Well, I don't want to say it was a case of last man standing because WIT definitely went out and won that race, but their, their challenges all seemed to run into problems. So, you know, we had uh, a retirement for the number uh, 32 or uh, United Auto Sports machine. Um, that was the car that made contact with uh, its sister car, the number 22, which then had a series of electrical problems, which wound down to just being a faulty battery that they spent you know, hours in the pits fixing everything else except the faulty battery. Uh, the the number 23 car had its own issues as well. It didn't uh, that finish down the order? Uh, well, uh, down the order in relative speaking, you know, it was th- uh, two laps down from the class winners. Uh, G-Drive, G-Drive had a car uh, retired from the race because of an accident with the, um, the number one uh, Ricard Mill racing machine. Uh, if I recall correctly, or well, it was involved in an accident, didn't get uh, didn't get retired, but it did have a. Oh no, it did get. No, that was the other G Drive car. Well, either, either way, the point is the G Drive car ran into problems as well, um, and the the second of the Yoda Sport cars, the the number thirty eight, just didn't seem to have the the pace. I, I think they must have run into trouble as well because they were five laps down. It just wasn't a clean Lamar for for those teams that we've expected such uh, a clean and clinical racing from. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the rain played a factor into it. Um, I mean, Anthony Davidson took this one really hard because he had that off and early on kind of in the, in the race, which uh, affected basically, um, I think it was just obviously then enough time because of the way that it finished, um, how close it was at the end, that they definitely would have had the lead had that spin not happened. Uh, I think that's Although, the other Joda car. Uh, oh, is it the 38? In the 38. It was the 28 that was in, oh, in the mix at the end. My, my apologies. My apologies. But yeah, I, I think there is um, LP2 could be something just from missed opportunities. Um, I guess outside of the 41's uh, you know, misfortune, uh, there was just a lot of um, you know mistakes that took out other LMP2s or themselves, really. I mean, I, I didn't see any like any any crazy poor driving it just was um you know uh, just slippery conditions very tricky conditions uh for a lot of the race and uh and then unfortunately yeah just uh, the head of the field just had that horrific last lap problem but yeah I, I think that was also too very very 
um, odd to see United and G Drive. At, at one point, that both of them were working their way up through the field, and you kind of had that feeling that they were going to start taking over. And then, obviously, the two car incident with United and the G Drive with, in, with issues as well it just kind of did not kind of turn out that way. So, um, and then WRT just having a very good inaugural season. <laughs> I, 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 it, it didn't seem inevitable, but it did feel like once WRT were kind of in the lead and then they were also climbing back with the other car, um, that they weren't really going to relinquish it. And, uh, they ended up not, I mean, for the team, but yeah. So what a crazy finish. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to talk about that finish. Do want to say that just for a little bit, uh, but Ollie, uh, broad thoughts on, on LMP2. It's brilliant. There was also, I just want to have a little moment on uh, LMP2 Pro-Am as well because mm. that was the first time that it actually felt like it was something that was legit worth fight, you know, something properly fighting for. It was coming down the last three in the last hour or the last stint. It was really, you know, some of them were different on fuel strategy. Um, some of them had the um, different level of driver talent in the car, so it was all kind of converging or potentially converging and you were working out with lap times like who's gonna come out on top and you know it was actual intrigue and interest in the p2 pro-am class for once Mm. um yeah i think it, it it was that was that was a nice little added edge there were you know it's kind of a shame that some of the top cars weren't in the contention at the end because you know if you added those cars that had trouble and had added them onto the train <laughs> on the last few laps fighting you know right up to the flag because the gap was really small if you yeah if you had a longer train fighting through the last laps uh, with all of these really high quality teams then it would have been a bit better potentially but um, you know these storylines of of top drivers like Anthony Davidson making mistakes and things like that. That's also ad- adds to the spectacle. But um, as a whole, um, yeah, really good. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Great point about uh, LMP2 Pro Am. Uh, you know, it it actually felt like an actual subclass for a change. And a uh, great point that you make there about the fight between Dragon Speed, a racing team Netherland, and uh, Real Team Racing. Uh, coming down to the the absolute wire in the end, it was only uh, something like thirty seconds separating uh, the the battle for. Uh, the uh, pro am victory, so uh, a, a decent result in the end for for Dragon Speed, uh, Headman Hanley on and Montoya. At one stage of the race, I noticed that Headman had less than a minute of drive time still left to go. So the fact that they actually cleared that for the Dragon Speed car without losing too much time is a, a story in itself. Uh, but certainly well done uh, for the the pro am teams and uh, for Dragon Speed USA in taking that victory. Uh, another another a few little. Uh, Results I want to point out, uh, moments of glory, to, so to speak. Uh, Panas Racing, Julian Canal, Will Stevens, uh, and uh, James Allen, a uh, third place for the team, a podium overall, or well, in LMP2, uh, just a lap down on the lead battle. Uh, that is an incredible result, uh, for Panas Racing, uh, after, uh, being sort of entirely anonymous all race we didn't really uh we, we kind of noted them as, as one to watch as a dark horse pre-race but the fact that they came through to, to take a podium that's that's astonishing work for the team mega and lmp2 as well mm. like again the competition that we said that, that they just didn't surface or had problems like that's what lamont does and the fact that you know they were able to do this um you know and not have the the ultimate outright pace to compete for class win, but um, just to finish there is, is incredible. And I mean, they were, they really, yeah, had a quiet race, didn't really put a foot wrong. They were up there, you know, uh, top, you know, five, you know, top five, top 10 from the entire race. Um, And it was just really cool to see that they just did not fall off. There was not really a problem where um, they started to kind of slip and fall down the, the the leaderboard. They just stayed right there, and they capitalized on the 41's problems at the last lap. 
Yeah, it takes, it takes a podium for them. And another uh, top five result for Inter Europol, uh, the Bakers. Uh, Smykowski, uh, Ranga, Van der Zand, and Alex Brundle taking a top five at Lamar. So they're another team as well that's certainly turned a corner and are uh, showing some proper competitive lap speed and race results as well. Uh, what about uh, the end of the the race then let's talk about this let's i've been kind of avoiding it so far because i do want to actually rip our teeth into it uh the the ceremonial end of the race uh with the the waving flag and the whole lmp2 battle let's let's dive into it so for those who haven't uh seen the very end of the race uh yet first of all like what the heck you should have gone back and watched it but there was a, a very interesting situation that was caused by the failure of the number 41 on the last lap and that was that the lmp2 battle for overall victory well lmp2 victory rather was immediately behind the battle for or the the overall winner so the two toyotas forming up for the finish uh so as the toyotas slowed down to take that ceremonial finish with the the uh checkered flag waver on the main straight uh what happened was there was a compression of the cars behind which included the uh number 31 team wit car and the number 28 joda car which were still battling for let's remember the lmp2 class victory uh which ended up seeing the number 31 swing out from behind i think it was the class winning gte pro ferrari to try and avoid the rear of the car as it slowed down and uh missing the the uh, the checkered flag marshal by not much uh certainly uh, certainly enough room for for him to be standing there but not by much it was uh, quite a distressing scene uh something that was uh, possibly well or not possibly definitely a little dangerous something that could have been thought through a little better and guys i just wanted to get your thoughts on the sequence of events that led to that and uh what you might be what you might have been thinking about since since that moment this happened i don't want to watch someone lose their legs on tv i think that's the the first yeah. thing that brings to mind um yes um <laughs> i don't know it, if we were very sleep deprived people with just a fandom kind of thing and not we're not professionals at this if we can notice that two cars are going to be battling to the line regardless of what happened to the to the 41 they were still going to be there fighting each other to the line um and you know we could still see it was going to be touch and go uh, to see who was who was going to take the honors out of those, those that pair of cars um it just happened to align really poorly by having two cars battling lining up behind two cars slowing down um for their photo finish um it used to be the case that the last i believe it used to be the case that the last race lap of the 24 hours was a procession where all the marshals were trackside waving the flags into the finish. And that changed when Audi and Peugeot were on the same lap battling at high speed and they didn't have the room for the cars to slow down no, it was whilst still during the race. Yeah. And so they told the marshals stay off the track. They're, they're battling to the line and then we'll do a cool down lap where you can go out. Um, that's the sort of thing that they should do on the fly, in my opinion. In in an in in a similar vein, where it's instead of all of the marshals, it's this single person. Because if you can see two cars that are going to be battling across the line, they can't be doing a slow roll over the line, which is it, some people would say still not safe. Um, but if that is acceptable by the clerk of the course, that if all cars are spaced out and going slowly, then that's safe enough. Mm. Then I, I, I can argue, I can see the arguments that that's acceptable. But if you've got cars that are within a certain parameter that's set, um, where they are going 
pushing across the line, then it, that, that person should not be there on track. It's like simple as that. Um, sure, there are several factors all overlapping, but regardless, if you've got a car that's hot going fast, there shouldn't be any human going near it, regardless if it's the clock of the course or if it's a marshal on a marshal post. You know, if you see a marshal walk out onto the track whilst it's full race pace, you would grimace, you would, you know, cringe. You'd expect it to you have would... double, double yellows around that part of the track. Exactly. And that person's wearing high vis. Mm. So arguably, they're more safe, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Either, like I, I said it at the time, either you have a gantry or you have a gap in the fence for him to lean out so he's still over the track um you can still do like tricks of perspective so if there was like a step in the wall like you know where where cars can be recovered through you've got a step in the patch fence so he can be like in the gap um so with a trick of the eye you can maybe get the wall um out of the way so it looks like he's standing on the track um or you have him further down the track you know where we had the the different start and finish line positions yeah previously if you have him doing the ceremonial photograph further down the circuit at the start line you, then there would be the chance of cars that are going hot across the line to slow down. Mm. And after straight after the finish line, you'd have flashing yellow boards. So then you have the the clerk of the course on track with some protection. Yeah, I, I think there are ways to not necessarily fix it, but to to make it safer and still have the show must go on aspect of having this tradition um but um this really was a good opportunity it, it sucked but it was a good opportunity to highlight something that was kind of people being me included have been turning a blind eye yeah and I, there's certainly an aspect of that and uh you know the fact that we've had it's something that's traditional and uh, you know it's just something that was traditional for all motor racing once upon a time but has been phased out over the years uh to to basically only be done now at Le Mans I can't think of any other race off the top of my head which has the flag bearer uh for the finish come onto the track like that uh I anymore I think Le Mans is the only one and it was a a, a very um a scary set of circumstances uh, with the battle for position so close to the back of the lead overall. I think that was the thing that really surprised maybe the organizers um, with, was the fact that the the slowing down for the overall victory was what caught up that battle and compressed it. Cookie, what were your thoughts uh, as well on on how that whole sequence of events panned out? Uh, I, I, I self-proclaim myself to be more old school, so... For me, it wasn't as as crazy of a uh, thing to see, but I do see where it, it can definitely be distressing for other people, uh, you know, considering what can potentially happen. Um, and uh, and the last thing that I want, if I if I will even like this in the first place, them, you know, him being out on the track and waving the flag is for that to end because of some incident like like this to go really bad. Um, so ultimately, I feel like this is. Up to the ACO, and I, you know, specifically, I feel like to just be smarter with this if it continues. I would like it to continue because I, I like seeing that, and I, and I think you're right. I don't know of any other track that does it. Um, you know, and there's so much pageantry and tradition uh, that is a part of the 24 Hours of the Law that uh, you know, I think this just it, it kind of adds to it. Um, my my thoughts are it's very easy just to make this a little bit safer and to make it so that you're not having this incident and uh, again, um, I think Ollie's suggestions are like you know um, more than I even thought about um, because I, frankly there is just there's a lot that they can do. I mean the pictures um, 
you know, he's, it looks like he doesn't have a headset on. I mean, he might have a concealed kind of earpiece thing that he can hear anything with that we're not seeing, but all he needs to do is just add a, just some trackside race headphones or something like that. Have it keyed to a certain channel. Um, with the he ACO left his radio a... on his desk. Oh, right. Classic. So he had no I, idea. I think, right. So I, and that's where I think, you know, if you're intelligent about it, do it that way or don't do it at all. And that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, yeah. I would like to see it continue, but if they're going to be boneheaded about it, then I don't want them to. Um, because yeah, you, all, you, you can even just have it where you have one spotter that's sitting looking at the four chicanes and just going like abort or green and whether or not he can go out there. And even if he doesn't know who is or what, he can at least go out there and know that like, okay, there isn't anybody that's basically going to threaten my life coming around the last chicane. Um, and it can be like a spotter's call, which he can then be listening to, or you could just come out for the class winners. Um, or again, like what Ali said, like there's a bunch of different ways we can go just to make it just a little bit safer without removing it. But yeah, I can understand that if that's the case, if, if it would continue like this without any changes. So, yeah. I, and I, I think that's a very reasonable stance to take. I, I'm in the same boat with you, uh, Cookie. I, I love the tra- tradition and the pageantry of that moment at Lamar because it is something, you know, very, very special. You have this, this, very emotional end to a 24 hour test in front of the full grandstand. And it's uh, not only is it, you know, something traditional and pageantry and, you know, all that sort of uh, very emotional outpouring uh, moment, but it's also like a marketing fodder. Like the photos that you get from that, it's just, it's incredible stuff. So if it's something that I would love to see continue, I think it's important that it does continue, but it's not so important that it, should be continuing in the face of safety issues uh and that was uh something that i tried to kind of get across in the the sort of post-race discussions that we were having on the subreddit and in the in the discord channel uh and uh, a few people uh took that to mean that i was advertising for it to continue without any sort of forethought or uh or uh re- rethink and uh i i don't th- I looking back on the comments I made in the post race said I don't think that those that is what I said, um, but some people seem to think so and they're entitled to their opinion. But I I think losing mindlessly removing that from the event is as as dumb a move as mindlessly continuing without rethinking that process. Uh, in my opinion, so that's that's my thoughts on the matter. And it's not a problem that we have to necessarily solve. It's a problem that's we've got the luxury of 10 months, nine months of, you know, motor, uh, motorsport, uh, ACO deliberations before we're at the same point again. So there's, there's plenty of time to come up with a better solution. And I, I think as Ollie said, something as simple as moving the guy down the track, 150 meters with yellow flags in front of him is, a, 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 it's a simple, a, a simple solution to, to that sort of thing. Um, it is, it's something that I, I think in my working memory, though, I don't think we've had a situation which has been similar to this uh, at, at, at any race that I've seen uh, with, you know, with a, a last lap battle being so close to the overall winners that are slowing down to take this ceremonial finish. Is that, you know, I, I can't think off the top of my head that a, a, of a finish that has been that close that has had that set of circumstances before. Is, is, is there anything that comes to mind for you guys? Um, I mean, there's been some GT Pro battles that have gone pretty close to the to the to the line, but not not where they were coming up on slow cars that were doing photo finishes. Yeah. So, well, well, the GT2, the battle in GT2 rages on. I guess is one example because they yeah. were right behind the winner, so they got an extra lap. Right ahead of well, the winner. Well, one of them didn't get an extra lap. <laughs> yeah. So that, they were in that situation. They were right ahead of oh, the, sorry. the, the yeah. winners. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, um, and and in that situation, I guess it's a good thing that there wasn't a man standing on the track because they friggin' wrecked across the line. Not, yes, yeah. Exactly. So so not that you're expecting you know cars to wreck across the line, but if there was a, a moment like that, and of course, if you don't know what we're, uh, we're talking about here, uh, look up the the uh, 2009 ALMS race at Laguna Seca. That's the one. Jan um yeah. Jan Magnussen and oh, was it? Your room, Blake and Molen? Yeah. Uh, yes, in yeah. the Flying Lizard 45. 
yeah, so that's one of like the classic all time classic ALMS finishes. So uh, or two thousand seven ALMS Sebring. Yes, that's the other one. That was uh, also Jerome Blake and uh, uh, Jimmy Bruni in the seat of that one. Uh, no, um, Mika Salo. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so... Oh, and you got Dries Van Tour going across the line on his roof. Um, that's kind of a bit of a weird one, where there's a finish line, and there's a car out of control, where anything could have happened, I guess. Yeah. When was that? Yeah, that's true. That was, uh, Macau. That was, I thought Macau was Lawrence Van Tour, and it wasn't across oh. the line, it was, uh, coming out of Rivier... Was- uh, the sweeper, and that was on like lap yeah. three, and they red flagged the race because of it. I oh they, yes, they he, it back at the time the he was yeah yeah at the start finish he was leading, but uh wasn't when he was on his roof. on his roof yeah. So yeah, there's certainly certainly reason for concern, but I hope that the ACO finds a solution that enables us to have our cake and eat it too, to to have this moment of tradition and. Uh, you know this uh, great finish to this uh, to this great race, and also ensures the safety of uh, the checkered flag away, away the, the the people on the track and you know everyone watching around the world because you know it had, as Ollie said we don't want to see someone get their legs broken on international TV that's kind of messed up. Yeah, I mean, just if you're going to wave the checkered flag, always remember your headset. Uh, yes, I I will agree with that. This podcast is proudly supported by The Racing Line. The Racing Line is a motorsport calendar and notification app for iPhones and iPads. It includes all major series, with more being added all the time, giving you a daily and weekly list of races so you can easily see what's coming up. All events are converted to your local time zone, so you no longer have to faff around, adding or taking away hours to work out start times in your area. Finally, it also lets you customise notifications for events so you can choose when you're notified about certain race series. The app is available on the iOS App Store. Just search for The Racing Line. Find out more at www.theracingline.app. Now, back to the podcast. GTE Pro, uh, a decent race to talk about. It it was a a bit of a race divided though. The early skirmishes between all eight cars kind of gave way to some large time gaps and some differing strategy and in the end it was uh, a battle between the the pair of Ferraris and the pair of Corvettes which I don't think any of us really picked uh you know all of our pre-race comments were talking about which one of the Porsches were going to be in the mix come the end of the race but uh really it was just all about all about the Ferrari at the end of the day what anniversary did they have oh I have no (laughs) idea (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you can't say that they didn't deserve it either, because like even in the lead up uh, at Spa and at uh, Aragon, uh, not Aragon. I'm saying Aragon because I'm watching the MotoGP on my other screen. I'm sorry, guys. At Portimao, they were uh, a class of the field. There, they had the tire life, the longevity. Even in uh, you know the the qualifying, the practice, even though it was the hub auto car that took. Uh, Super Pole, the Ferraris were right there in the mix. Uh, you, you can't really question Ferrari's strength coming into the, the race, but it, it did surprise me that they didn't really seem to be challenged, and especially not by the Porsches. Yes, I think the what we what you mentioned with Hub Auto being on uh, Hyper Pole, um, I think it's kind of a misleading. You know, you, you think, oh, well, the car on Hyper Pole is going to uh, be the fastest car across in the race and then therefore the Porsches are going to be the fastest chassis um, I think we've seen over the past year or so the Porsches have had the best peak pace you know re- think back to Estra at Spa like having ridiculous qualifying lap so much faster than everyone else and I think over a, over a stint length um, the 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 Ferraris are more consistent. So it's kind of like a hidden advantage as it were, when you just watch going from qualifying to, to the race or, or you just look at the peak times in practice. Um, so I guess they have been a bit of a sleeper, but um, yeah, just clean race. 
Absolutely right. Uh, the other Ferrari, so, so it was a bit of a mixed bag actually in the results because it was Ferrari from Corvette from the pair of Porsches, but the pair of Porsches were laps back at this point. Um, the other Ferrari and the other Corvette both had problems after being in the mix overnight. So the number 52, Sarah Molina and Sam Birdcar, they finished 14 laps down and the number 64 Corvette of number uh, Tommy Milner, Nick Tandy and Alexander Sims were the last classified finisher uh, at 32 laps down on the class winner. Uh, but despite running an effectively clean race uh, with no problems for either Porsche. They were laps off the pace. You know, uh, Estra, uh, Johnny, and Christensen were one lap down. Bruni, Leitz, and Makovecki, two laps down. They just didn't have the pace. And that's so unlike Porsche uh, with, with the RSR 19. We're so used to seeing them have the the pace, especially at, at Le Mans. I mean, you remember the year that they did the the pair of tribute liveries and they were just the class of the field for the entire race it's so unlike them to struggle at Le Mans and they they it's the second year in a row that they've struggled around Le Mans cookie what what do you make of that for Porsche um I, I don't know just a, a lack of kind of I don't want to say effort but uh it, it does it does kind of feel like it's it's gotten a bit stale with some of their um I know some of the lineups, uh, not really outside of really Kevin Estra just blowing the doors off people earlier in the season, um, you know, which has really kept them in contention. And they've just really not had the the pace that they wanted to. Um, it's it's puzzling. I mean, I'm I'm not sure if it's maybe just the chassis itself or just um, kind of the direction that they went with with the new evolution of the you know 911. I, I don't know. Um, on paper, they should be you know, right up there, if not potentially better than AF Corsa, you know, uh, but just maybe based on how the regulations are, or at least the VOP that's been going on, um, they just, they don't have that window, that comfortable window that they can ride in um, and click away lap times as, you know, consistently as the Ferrari can right now. Um, And they certainly don't have the numbers um, to kind of give them a ton, as much data as they used to get, um, when they fielded four factory cars, I'm sure. So, um, you know, every, every little bit kind of um, hurts them, um, which can kind of add up to just being not enough when um, the competition is just that high, um, which it always has seemed to have been in um, GT Pro, uh, which is kind of evident from what you could see from some of the uh, the pro, the non-factory pro entries that were there this year with Porsche. So, um Great lap though with the qualifying by Habato. I mean, mm, uh, that was a great flyer lap. That's that's something that definitely should be celebrated. Uh, uh, an extra little bit of data that might help um, color in some some uh, pictures for everyone at home. Uh, looking at the event maximum speed across the twenty four hours of Le Mans uh, for the GT classes, the the fastest top speed at the speed trap was Nick Tandy at three hundred and nine point one kilometers per hour uh, in the Corvette uh, C eight point R. Uh, the two Ferraris are next in the 307s, and then the next Corvette, the 307s. Best uh, top speed for a Porsche across the, the weekend. Uh, a uh, The number 91 car, Jimmy Bruni, uh, 309 kilometers per hour. So that's four kilometers per hour at peak speed that the Porsche were down compared to their GTE Pro competition. In fact, some of the AM cars were quicker in a straight line compared to the Porsches. That's That's... Not what you're looking for at a place like Le Mans. In fact, I, I think that goes beyond just, uh, you know, driver error or even to an extent BOP. That that to me seems like a setup issue. If that, if that is, is BOP, then something has gone terribly wrong in the BOP process. No, it's their setup is too good. If they're managing to get pole position when their top speed is four or five, six kph lower then it has to be they're making that time back up in the corners. So they're too good in the corners. And yeah, um, or um, Corvette and Ferrari sandbagged until after qualifying. Sandbagged on straight line speed? Well, to get more uh, engine boost. Well, yeah. in, in fact, both of the, well, the Ferrari specifically actually got boost taken away uh, in the the between the qualifying and the race. So everyone was up in arms about that, saying it was too much and why they're making adjustments. And in the end, it didn't matter in the at all anyway. 
Mm. Was that during? Was that best speed during the race hours? Uh, that's event maximum speed, and all uh, it's got. Uh, uh, if you're looking at uh, FIA dot uh, FIAWC dot Alcamel Systems dot com, uh, all of the for the GTE Pro cars, all of their event maximum speed was in the race. Uh, ex- uh, yeah. So all, for in fact, all the GTE cars. Uh, had their best maximum speed during the race, right. except for the Iron Lynx Ferrari uh, with Michelle Gatting behind the wheel, which had their best lap, uh, top speed in free practice two. And Team Project One uh, at the hands of Dennis Olsen, who had their top speed in free practice four. In fact, if you look at the the, the bottom 10 cars uh, for the top speed, uh, they're all Porsches except for one Ferrari uh and they're all in uh, all the GTM Porsches, effectively. So something, something is to me that sound that sounds systemic uh, from a Porsche point of view. Uh, that that's that's a, a a some sort of flaw in the car that means that they're not extracting the maximum amount of speed that they can get compared to the other GTE cars. Well, they need to get worse cornering performance, and then they'll get given a bit more boost or <laughs> fuel, I guess. Or, uh, uh, sorry, uh, air restrictor. That's it. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, a bit of a, a, a weird one for Porsche in the end. Uh, what about the other the Porsche efforts, the two wild cards, both of them uh, running into a little bit of issue. I think the number uh, number 79, the WeatherTech racing car, that ended its race in the wall, if I recall correctly. Uh, was it Cooper McNeil having an accident in the four chicanes uh, that brought that Lovely. car into the garage? Yep. Uh, and the hub auto racing that had a electrical problem at Dunlop, I think, uh, that saw it pull up underneath the bridge and not get moving again. That was my pick. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, hey, they got hyperpole points for you. Yay! Um, what, what do you reckon for those for those privateer Porsches? Were they a a, a decent enough addition to the pro class, or could we have just as easily done without them? More is good. More is more is always good. Especially when the, the the class is a bit thin on the ground, um, but yeah, it's a bit opportunistic. Opportunistic. It's easier to get a pro entry right now because the ACL will probably, you know, let you in cheap, as it were, compared to a few years ago when it was um, booming. Uh, it's a bit awkward when you have like a pro am entry yeah. in in GT Pro with Cooper McNeil but you know you've got the privateer history of Le Mans and you know you want to go and go with your car and take it to Le Mans and you don't want to drive with a bronze you want to drive with some pro guys so see how you go you know they won at Sebring sure they got a lot of luck but you know weird things happen and they they could they could still win. I was more focused on the the Hub Auto car, which was, you know, a really interesting wild card into could they, as outsiders, take it up to the the really pro teams um, and yeah, outdo their own factory team. That would be pretty cool, but mm. uh, unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Yeah. They they did they did shock everyone in Hyperpole though, and that's something that uh we'll, we will all remember for at least a little while. Uh, their their great result. Uh, there. Uh, what about Corvette? A debut at Le Mans for Corvette. Uh, Cookie, what did you make of their their first outing uh, at the at the twenty four hours of Le Mans? Uh, they got they got mighty close at the very end of it. Yeah, um, not not bad at all, and um really appreciated that they came out here to, to, to compete like that. Um, you know, that's no, that's no small feat. And, um, you know, and obviously how high the competition is, um, in that, in all classes, but just to be at Le Mans and, um, I, I thought it was a great effort. Um, you know, an unfortunate kind of ending to it, but outside of that, I, I, I think this year I've, I've, I've been very, I've been more impressed by teams than I've been disappointed by teams. I, I think there's definitely been some, dis, there's some disappointments on the, uh, on the, on the finishing chart, but um, just a lot of good storylines, a lot of like positives to take away from it, from the field this year, I feel like. So um, yeah, I thought they'd had a good, good maiden outing. 
So, guys, GTE Pro, have we seen the best of GTE Pro at Le Mans? Are we watching the... Are we on the downslide of GTE Pro at Le Mans? Yeah. Arguably, we have been already for the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, Considering what it used to be. Are are we going to see a good... uh, Would you have called this a good GTE Pro race? Uh, Um... Not really. (laughs) Based on that pause, that's your answer. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Will we get another good GTE Pro race before the class uh, becomes defunct? No. You have to wait and see next Ooh. time on WEC. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, da, da, da. We've got at least one more Le Mans 24 hours for GTE Pro machinery uh, with 2022. Uh, the news from Le Mans was it's going to end for GTE Pro after 2023 was that right i can't remember soon tm is when it's going to end so we've got at least one more so hopefully we can get a, a good gt pro race uh filed away for that uh but it, it was a it was a strong race for the af course of ferrari and uh, alessandro piagridi james galato and comb Ledegar. great result for comb Ledegar, i gotta say he he absolutely yeah. stood up to to uh to be a part of that factory team and to make him seem like he belonged there really. And it was uh, very impressive to see him do so well. Uh, and just as an aside, by the way, guys, if you are looking at getting the number 51 Lego Technic, uh, uh, model, uh, it is a great build. So, uh, I, I completed that over the last week to, uh, to honor their victory and very, very impressed with it. So if you're looking at it, you should, you should maybe think about picking it up. To honour the the victory for the number fifty one, maybe. maybe, maybe. I mean, you know, the the future GT Pro is really bleak because uh, AF, AF of course, is probably just going to be doing um, GT Am, and then when it, whatever we pivot to the next GT phase, uh, I mean, they they certainly might be the the pro outfit for whatever they have, but there's definitely going to be quite a there should. I mean, if all whatever point signs we're pointing to here. There's going to be quite a few Ferrari chassis that can be supported by some form of a factory team. So, you know, how much of Ferrari is going to have this huge mega effort from AF Corsa that's dedicated specifically for the GT uh, program um, versus, you know, if we even see Corvette here or what they do, because I have no idea what Corvette do. Um, And then obviously, you know, with Porsches having to deal with, um, you know, uh, the fleets of Porsches that can basically be ferried in. So, yeah, I I, I don't know. I I just feel like this is uh like I, I wish there was a, a better outcome for this, but yeah. um they just I, I I don't know. I think with the the SRO's plan of of things is little is not like quite where my, you know my brain's at where I want GT racing to be. But I mean they've got strength in numbers and they certainly have the manufacturer's attention. So. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when we get to those kind of, you know, times. And if the ACO decide to make something that's slightly, slightly, slightly different still, which is very much their, yeah, ACO their song in dance. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and now that I think about it, all three manufacturers here in GTE Pro, Porsche, Ferrari, and Corvette, uh, will have some sort of LMH, LMDH, uh, commitment in the coming years of course we haven't actually heard what gm is doing but we're assuming that it, the worst kept secret in motorsport is going to happen um so uh, yeah corvette or whether that is a corvette or whether that's a cadillac um lmdh for the general motors brand um well yeah we're expecting to, uh them to to join as well so yeah how much resources gets allocated from uh the gt pro factories into their LM- LMH or LMDH efforts over the coming years is going to be something that's going to be a factor as well. Any last thoughts, lads, on GTE Pro before we move on to the AM side of things? I don't want it to go. I, I agree. I agree, Ollie. I, it, we have seen some incredible racing from GTE Pro over the years, and I, I think I still every now and then look back at specifically at the last lap of the 2017 Le Mans with the, the Corvette and the, the Aston Martin uh, battling it out through the final lap all to themselves effectively, because uh, that's just that's just absolutely peak WEC and peak GT racing. Look I, out I... for a... Oh, sorry. Uh, look out for a, a potential 
Aston Martin Pro Ooh. entry. Ooh. Um, it's a little rumour that I spotted in terms of uh, TF Sport picking up a Pro entry, but that might not be full full season because you know budget's pretty difficult. But um, hopefully they'll go out with a bang next time. If it is next time, that's the last one. Sorry, Cookie, go on. <laughs> no, we, uh, we, I would love a spectacular finish to, to finish it off, but I don't know. I think it's those wide body kits or just a little bit of the regulations where they were, you could kind of, the car just lo- looked lower to the ground. It reminded me of like the GTO um, classes in uh, IMSA Ooh, in the uh, nice. late 80s, early 90s, kind of just where they're just low sunk. They're GT cars, but they are like, stupidly quick gt cars and really the only things that are faster than my prototypes and that, like that's the case and i think too uh what is you know just crazy to me is like how quick that the gt pro cars can go in relative terms to what we were seeing in the 80s and 90s from the prototype cars like i mean they're clicking times that are basically the exact same as those cars and we, we just look at those cars as being just insanely quick um and they're just right there in terms of relative pace. And it's just, yeah, I, I, I love the class cause it, it, you, you feel like a weird kind of, it, it it's its own thing. It's, it's mm. GT racing, but it's like this hyper advanced form of GT racing. And I just feel like over, through the history, especially in LMS years, we all know uh, GT one racing. Um, you know, those kind of cars are just like what the fans really, really love. Um, despite sometimes not having the car counts needed to to really argue for the class being there in the first place. So, yeah, I don't want it to go either, Ali. And, and the, <laughs> I love it. Just just to, to round off your point there, Cookie, uh, in the uh, the Endurance Legends race, the, the uh, support category, uh, there was an Aston Martin DBR9 that was lapping faster than the uh, Porsche uh, 911 GT1 from 1996. So yeah, just show that in fifteen years of uh, machinery, uh, that the the the, uh, the increase in pace is so much that a GTP car is getting overtaken by a a, a GT two machine. It was just kind of astounding. Yep. yep. Yeah. Wild stuff. Uh, so the other GT class, of course, GTM had had its own string of storylines as well. Uh, this car, this class had the highest attrition rate of any class in the Le Mans 24 hours. With let's count them: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cars not finishing the race out of a possible uh 23. Uh, so some quick maths there tells me that's almost a third of the cars. Uh, in total, not making it to the end of the race. And there were some weird accidents uh, that caused these cars to come a cropper. Uh, notably, the number 98 car takes the, the Ledger as the unluckiest car at Le Mans once again with their accident uh, in... Oh, someone will have to remind me where it was because it happened while I was asleep, so I didn't really register it properly. Oh, gosh. Was it... Was, was it no, it wasn't Tetra Rouge. Indianapolis? No. I can't remember. Wait, 98? 98, yeah. Yeah, oh, he um, went no, straight on. Ent- yeah. Entry into Indianapolis, he got boxed yeah, out by a P two car. Yeah, so he was he was in the green kind of strip right before the right hand that fast right hander kink heading into Indianapolis left hander. And, and, and it is the it. most it is the most Paul Delalana thing to happen at Le Mans since Paul Delalana crashed it in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, 15 rather but i think the most paul delana thing about that as well is the fact that there is one driver out of the entire field that did not turn any laps in the race and guess who that was Go, man. Oh, paul i want to give him a hug yeah i want to give him a hug he's the just, most like huggable person there is just something <laughs> wrong with his luck at Le Mans. He's, he's had the, the old gypsy woman curse uh, around here since that crash in 2015 after uh, leading in the latter stages of the race. So uh, very sad for me to wake up a few, after a few hours of sleep early on the race to, to see that car out. Another car that I was very bemused by was the number, I think it was the 46 Team Project 1 car that had a big crash at Mulsanne 1. Uh, that was, it actually happened while I was in the middle of, uh, asleep and I actually stirred, saw that crash and went, huh, that's weird. And just rolled back over and went back to bed. Uh, so, uh, weird, weird for, the, for me to see that car in such a, a sorry state. That was a big hit at the Mulsanne, uh, tire barrier there. Was that all yeah, on I his think, own as well? Um, well, there, there were, there were kind of rumors as it were that 
there was some oil down in that area. Oh, okay. But I think that was kind of, well, with the um, Aston Martin, the, the Keating car that went off right after it, it was kind of, you know, oh, well, then therefore there must be a slippery surface if two cars are going off. But I think the Keating car had a rear puncture, so it couldn't slow down yeah. for the chicane because it had a the puncture. Um but it was weird, and yeah, it was big enough impact for, to set off the um, um, medical light. Medical light, yeah. yeah. Um, and another one. Ever since they won the championship, they've kind of that that Porsche squad have been a bit, I don't know, lukewarm. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. They kind of burst onto the scene uh, in 2019 with that that incredible championship run with uh, Edigio Perfetti in that car, and then just kind of haven't had the same run of luck results anything since. It's it's kind of a, been a, been a symptom of of GTM really and GTM Porsches because you can say the same thing about Dempsey Proton. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, it, it evolves over time and, you know, it's getting more and more competitive. And they were one of the first that that were kind of being called out for having ridiculous Porsche Super Cup drivers come in out of nowhere and, yeah, become really, really good affiliated brand silver drivers, which historically that hasn't happened so much in the class, but now is normal yeah um yeah uh and and another few cars that ran into problems uh the rinaldi racing car finally uh succumbed to its many many issues early on in the uh well sorry actually uh, late on in the morning uh proton racing had a a car not finished the number 99 car the uh the viticorn intravivisac uh uh, Harry Tinknell and uh, Florian Latour car uh, ran into some issues. Uh, JMW didn't finish the race. Spirit of Race didn't finish the race. Team Project One had neither car get to the end. Uh, Kessel Racing ran into issues, and and Settler Racing, one of the pre-race favourites, uh, the winners at Portimao, they also didn't make it to the finish line. I didn't see what happened to Settler because they were out while I was asleep. Uh, can anyone shed any light? on what happened to them for me, because that was another surprise. For they me. went off at Tetra Rouge. Oof, that's not, think... not ever a nice one. Yeah, it was it, it was a bit shit, because they were going up into the race from the previous few rounds, like really on top form, to kind of take it to the TF Sport and the AF Corsa, so it would be you know, three ridiculously strong entries going up against each other. But yeah, they took themselves out, unfortunately. But um, they'll come back. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's talk about the cars that did make the finish line, Cookie. And it was uh, a surprise for me when I heard this, but not necessarily a surprise on paper. Uh, the the winners, of course, uh, AF course of Francois Perotto, Nicholas Nielsen, Alessio Rivera, uh, the, the team that has been breaking the driver rating system this season. But uh, the, the surprising stat for me is that it's AF course's first win uh, at Le Mans in the GTM class ever. Yeah, that's surprising to me. And, and not only did they take the win, they took the, the, the double with GTE Pro as well. Was uh, Have they had wins, but they were technically servicing somebody else's Ferrari kind of thing? Not not as a not as a team name, no. They they I, I think the, the last, the Ferrari GTM winners I can think of off the top of my head have been uh, SMP Racing, uh, JMW BMW. Motorsport, yep. Um, and Rizzi was... win it too at one point. What was that, sorry? Rizzi? Did Rizzi win it? Uh, not, not Reezy, but also not, not Reezy. I think it was Bill Swedler and Townsend Bell that won. Yeah, what was that? That wasn't an AF Corsa car. That might have been, oh, what year was that? That was the year that Patrick Dempsey came second. So I'm going to guess that was 2014. I, but I don't think that was a, a, a AF Corsa car. Um, so yeah. (laughs) No, I don't think so either. That was something different, but yeah, that, yeah, that's surprising to me. So, so what did you make of the GTM race then for for, for the likes of um, uh, AF Corsa and the other the other podium winners? Um, yeah, it was a great result for uh, you know the Ferrari 
seem to be the the chassis to be on for the weekend. Um, you know, I think um, thirty three finishing um, in second is a uh, is a good result for them. I, I'm sure that they were probably aiming for a win, um, and you can say the same with pretty much a lot of the Iron Links um, uh, team that they they've done really well, and they've had a that you know the organization has had a really great year. Um, you know, winning spot twenty four. So uh, I, I think this is. Uh, this could definitely, you, you could say that this is more of like the cream of the crop for GTM, uh, minus maybe uh, a Porsche uh, entry uh, that finished in the top three. Um, I'd, you know, of course, a TS Sport and Iron Lynx, they're, I mean, I'd say world class. So uh, this kind of, um, it was a, a race of attrition, uh, but in the end, um, I, I think it was the you know, the best three outfits or best three teams that were finishing in the top three positions. So, And and just a quick note on that Iron Lynx team, uh, Matteo Cressoni, Reno Mastronati, and Ka- uh, Callum Eilert, they won the uh, 23 hours of Spa-Francorchamps in class as well. Not, uh, not what, three weeks before the, the 24 hours of Le Mans? So uh, great, a great result for them to back up and ta- take a podium at another big 24-hour endurance race. Great feather in the cap. Yeah, and and uh, on that note as well, just as an aside, hey, of course, uh, uh, the the drivers for that car, Pierre Guidi, James Collado, and I'm pretty sure Combe Ledegar as well were the winners as Iron Lynx in the uh, the 24 Hours of Spa overall. So uh, it's a, it's a great time to be in a Ferrari 2021. Apparently, if you're a sports yep. car driver, especially when they're uh, going to be bringing out LMHs soon, so might as well get, put some good effort in, um, you know, and, and see where the chips fall if they end up wanting to field more cars so absolutely do. uh the the best place porsche in the gt anfield was the number 77 dempsey proton racing car of christian reed jackson evans and matty campbell they finished five laps down from the overall uh sorry the gtm winner and it, it was a bit of a story of gtm the fact that there were these big time gaps between each of the cars you know the one lap between the winners in second place, another further lap to down to third, three laps down to fourth place, the second of the Iron Lynx cars. And then uh, they were the only ones who, uh, only ones out of the top five to finish on the lap, the same lap as another competitor uh, in uh, Dempsey Proton. Uh, what do you make of that? Is, is the driver stint strategies and the, the various restriction place on uh, GTM, does that make for, at times... Uh, harder to follow racing or more strategic racing compared to the sort of door to door action in GTE Pro, is that something that might might be improved upon or needs an, needs improvement, Ollie? Well, no. the 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 point of amateur format racing is it's open to all. Um, if you're good enough to race, um, so you're going to have a broad spectrum of talents and. Um, consistencies and some drivers are going to be making some mistakes and some of those mistakes may need time in the garage or they might get stuck in the gravel or something like that so you're going to get a, a broader spectrum whereas with pro the drivers are much closer together at the cutting edge um lap per lap so with am with an am only future after GT Pro leaves this uh, the series, um, yeah, we're going to have what we have now in GT um, as the only GT racing, and they're going to be yeah bigger gaps. So we're we're going to have door to door banging at the start, just like any GT um, race. Um, it's just it it would spread out a bit um, faster than um, a, a pro race. Um, yeah, and, and that's of course a function of you know not only driver skill, but when you're using each specific driver, and when you're using bronzes versus professionals or silver drivers, and what tires you're putting them on, and when in the race uh, you're you're making these decisions, whether or not that's under safety car or not, and all these other complicating factors. So it is a real uh, strategy battle. It it was a surprise to me, uh, sort of leaving the race fairly early on, because the the race started at eleven thirty p.m. for me uh, after a full day's you know out and about sort of start. 
half. So I, I only saw the, the first real you know hour and a half of running before having to take a, a bit of a nap. Um, it, it was surprising me for me coming back that the gaps had already diverged so much at the end of uh, just a six hour sort of section of time. So uh, not not necessarily the most enthralling GTM battle, but uh, they got a lot of airtime thanks to a, a bit of quietness in the other classes. Uh, AF Corsa as well, particularly getting getting a, a lot of camera focus. Of of course, being the the winning. Uh, the winning team uh, in that number 83 and they really the 83 just really has been the class of the season truth be told and uh, Ollie I, I think you said it best when uh, you, you said as one of your article titles that they struck gold with their silver yeah uh, I, uh, I mean lucky for them they get their short but sweet time in the limelight uh, before they get upgraded to, to gold yeah Good luck with their with their pro careers, but um, we'll see who they find next to be their super silvers. Yeah, of course, talking about Alessio Rivera, who uh, at one stage I think does did he hold the fastest lap of the race in GTM? That wouldn't surprise in, me if he well, did. Well, in all GTS, it wouldn't surprise me. I think he had the fastest lap of all GTS at one uh, point. It was. Dylan Pereira who ended up with the fastest lap of the race in GTEM. Uh, which, by the way, was a three minute forty nine, and Dylan Pereira was in the second place car in in the end, the TF Sport car. Uh, a a, a three forty nine as a GTM car, that's kind of messed up. Remember when GT cars were struggling to do like four minute fours at Le Mans only like five <laughs> years ago? Yep. Yeah, pace has increased by a ton. That's crazy. Uh, uh, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> truth be told, I'm kind of uncomfortable with that. And, like, not from a safety aspect, but uh, but a little bit from a safety aspect, but just from, like, a, a quickness of competition aspect. As, as Cookie just said, the pace has just increased so much. It's it's mental. Is that a problem? Is that a problem that the pace in, in GT racing specifically has increased so much? I mean, it's, you're seeing it in the amount of spending that the factory teams are doing to try to best themselves. I mean, GTM is a product of GT Pro, so this is just a product of... I mean, the, you know, the budgets that can be spent to try to win um, factory via, you know, versus factory. So um, it's not really surprising. Um, I, I think the amount may be a little bit surprising, but it's certainly not surprising to see um, just a, a pace increase, especially just, too, from what we understand with aerodynamics and downforce and, you know, car setups and, you know, just how intricate and how specific a lot of these chassis are being designed. Um Know, to get the you know the the best average performance out of out of the car from any driving style or and condition. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're just we're just seeing a lot of different rough edges be refined in the GT class itself um, by way of just a, a lot of vicious and a, um, close factory fighting for like a decade. So, yeah, exactly right. Uh, and one thing I hope that it doesn't happen is that we don't get such a pace creep that uh, we start you know kind of overlapping classes that would become a bit of a problem uh not that we're getting anywhere near close to that but uh we have seen an advance in pace uh across the board in the wec uh quite a lot over the past few seasons which is caused a bit of a problem with of course lmh being a bit slower than lmp1 and stratification etc etc you've heard us talk about all this before guys gtm any final thoughts and comments before we we wrap everything up with a nice little bow on top GTM good. Bad boy. Yeah, GTM good. Don't go. Very right, good. I, I yeah. like honestly, if if GTE Pro has to go, I'd love GTM to just stick around and be like the only GT racing. I, I've found great enjoyment in tracking the class over the past few years, and I, I feel like it deserves a bit more of a limelight. It'll be on camera more. Yeah, certainly. If there's if there, it's the only GT racing, then it's certainly going to be the one that's going to take the limelight. So that wraps up our discussion on the 24 hours of the one well it wraps up our class by class discussion uh any final thoughts or overall sort of compelling comments you need to make about the 24 hours of the more the 89th edition for 2021 um bring on the the hypercars bring on more <laughs> hypercars yeah you, may, you you sound so convinced are you still like uh, three quarters asleep is that the problem here 
No, I mean, I don't know. It's um, it's for, it's for those playing a... along. By the way, just just sorry, Cookie. For those playing along, we did have to get Cookie up before eight o'clock on a Sunday morning to record this podcast with us. So, uh, props Tough. props to you, Cookie, for being around. I know that I wouldn't be getting yeah. up before eight on a Sunday morning for basically anything. Well, yeah. Well, sometimes sometimes motorsport calls for it uh, when you live in the U.S. and stuff happens not That's here. True. So, yeah, I'm used to it. But no, I mean, I don't know. It's um. Uh, I I love I love the prototypes, so that's mostly my my jam. And uh, I I don't, um, it, you know, there there was nothing crazy to note outside of the LMP2 um, debacle on the last lap. That you know, uh, I, beyond Toyota kind of impressing me with some of their reliability and whatnot. Although, um, you know, as we stated, and Ali said that it was just it, it's hard to gauge these because you don't really have that heads up competition from you know. I'd say, quote unquote, an equal contender with them. So um, it, it felt a little just lackluster. Um, it felt much more like Audi, like you know, when they were really just dominating everything, um, and, and and that inevitability of Audi winning it, it has that feeling to it a little bit on this one, um, without the actual competition to be like, wow, the uh, you know, what a dominating victory over another chassis. So. I don't know. I, I think it's more of the same for me. And, um, you know, it was a great race in all the other classes, but I, I really like overall battles and, uh, yeah. and specifically seeing really, really, really fast prototypes battle. And we just didn't see a lot of that this year, um, in that category, but outside of that, it was, it, it was a solid race and, um, it, it was definitely not in the worst part of my rankings just because we had a lot of weather too so a lot of inclement weather and changing conditions which i usually really like those as well so yeah fair mixes enough. it up yeah absolutely uh, i think you make a great point there about toyota being really hard to gauge where they're at because they haven't really had a a, a adequate adequate's probably not a fair word but i'm going to use it anyway an adequate competitor over the last three or four additions to, to really compare themselves against. Um, so, or, or for us to, to use as a point of reference, you know, when they had Porsche and Audi, we, we knew how good Porsche and Audi were because we've seen it time and time again uh, before that. So when we, we saw Toyota mixing it at the front, we kind of got an idea of where they were, but it's hard to sort of gauge how, how good they are because they just have been so dominant. Uh, Ollie, what about you? Uh, overall thoughts on the, on the 24 hours of Lamar? Bloody good, isn't it? <laughs> it is a good it is a good motor race do love it. it is is that all you got or is there, there's something more comprehensive going on <laughs> i mean that's great uh, i don't know um no it's uh it's just good there's just there's always stuff going on um there's a bit of controversy you know with the the richard mill crash at night and the the finish with the flag man um but you know, it sets up another round of narrative for next year. You know, oh, what if Toyota, you know, have their issues again? Can they won't be able to have those issues again with Peugeot in? What are Peugeot going to be like? Uh, are Alpine going to stay? Probably. Um, are they going to get more favourable balance of performance that offsets their? Um, Stint de- deficit if they commit finally to a hypercar uh, long term, you know. Um, can Glickenhaus with the new tyres step up to really properly challenge Toyota over a stint? You know, it's those sorts of things um, that it's still with a positive spin, um, keep, keeps you coming back for more. No, oh, that's very beautifully put, Ollie, and I I, 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 I do agree. Uh, there is something always about Le Mans, despite how whatever the lead up has been or whatever uh, problems the series might be facing. There is just something about Le Mans that I always find very romantic and very sort of settling. And and I've got to say, for me this year, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, kind of missing part of it if that makes sense missing all the chaos to start with and just kind of coming back to a a settled race with cars just pounding around through the french countryside i I just kind of it's 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 good in it as as ollie said (laughs) sorry for sorry for doing that to you ollie (laughs) right 
something we didn't mention though uh, throughout this podcast is the SRT41 team, the the conditional entry, the uh, Frederick Sosse Foundation. Uh, they made it home. They finished the race. Uh, so congratulations to to them uh, and uh, on their efforts. Uh, it's a uh, great to see that. Uh, the that car made it to the end and uh, ran without any major problems at all. I, I don't think we we even got a shot of it in the garage for any length of time. So uh, well done, well done to them, and uh, another successful showing for SRT Forty One. Absolutely, yeah, good on them. Um, yeah, uh, there's a especially in the uh, change conditions, and it was definitely slippery. Um, I mean, it just goes to show that you know, what technology can do to really enable people to, to to perform at an equal level to, you know, or very near an equal level to others. Um, you know, even having <laughs> missing appendages or, you know, uh, disabilities. So it, that it, it was a really cool thing to see and yeah. And not to see them be really kind of stuck in the garage for any extended amount of time was, um, you know, I think was really important and they kind of built on their previous outing um, where they were here uh, a few years ago as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ELMS race next weekend, uh, the the uh, four hours of, oh, where are we at? Uh, Spa-Francorchamps, I believe, is the next round of the European Le Mans series. We haven't, we haven't had uh, any time to talk about European Le Mans series all year. So I think we're going to make a point at the end of the, the year to do a full season wrap up because there's been certain ELMS races, which definitely warrant talking about, but on the whole, it's, it's been a good season in the European Le Mans series. And uh, it would be good to see some of these cars that have raced around Le Mans back out on track very shortly. Noise. Noise. Can't wait. Noise indeed. Mm-hmm. Let's hope that the, the, the famous spring weather in the, uh, the Eiffel mountains uh, doesn't, sorry, no, it's the Ardennes. As far as the Ardennes, right? I'm getting all my my freaking my my forests and geographical European locations confused. It, Eiffel Eiffel Mountains is uh, Nurburgring, right? Yeah, yeah, close enough. Close I mean, enough. They're, they're, they're both... all uh, Europe's <laughs> all all on top of each other anyway. Um, so that'll be that'll be yeah. next well this coming weekend at the time of release. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Cookie, and thank you very much, Ollie, for for joining me tonight. Thank you, Lord Ralston. And and well, and thank you guys for being on my case about getting around to recording this. I know it hasn't been easy, so uh, thank you for keeping me uh, keeping me honest and getting me on top of that. Uh, thank you very much to the Racing app, your motorsport calendar, for sponsoring us uh, this year and for helping uh, put all this together. Really, uh, giving us the sort of uh, freedom to to do all this the way that we want to, and giving us a little bit of uh, a little bit of sponsorship for it. Um, so uh, check it, check them out um, for the rest of the year. You know, a lot of still calendar changes coming in so uh making sure that you're abreast of all of that uh thank you very much for listening and yeah it's it's been it's been great to have another year of Le Mans underneath our belt it's, it's always a, a very special event and to be able to share that with all of our listeners and with all of you it's 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 honestly a, a privilege and on that note i've been michael salivari peace out four wins in a row Le Mans Gazoo. Why are we like this?